What's up my producer friends, it's David with another monsterproductions.com and today I want to talk about compression. So compression is a process that I think is often misunderstood and even though there's a lot of information out there about what compression is, I think a lot of it can be kind of confusing. And so my goal with this video is to hopefully give you a good fundamental understanding of what compression is, how it can be used, and then we're going to take a look at the compressor in our fruity limiter and I'm going to show you what some of the knobs actually do. So there are actually many different types of compression and compressors, but for the most most part they all work in a similar way and for the sake of this video I really don't want to get too deep into the different kinds of compression so we're going to try and keep things pretty simple. So in order to understand what compression is, I think it's important to understand what dynamic range is. And the term dynamic range can be applied to an entire mix or song, or it can be applied to just a particular sound of some sort. For instance, in the case of this sound here, this is just a snare sample that we have. And the dynamic range of this particular sound, the snare, is the difference between the quietest part versus the loudest part, which in this case is the initial transient. Uh, this, this sort of spike right here, the snap of the snare, that is the transient. And you can kind of see that in this waveform here. So in theory, if we wanted, we could take a compressor and compress this transient of the snare and bring it down and also potentially bring up the, the quieter part of it. And we could do this for a couple reasons. One would be to completely reshape this and turn it into a different sound, or we could do more subtle compression to essentially try and squeeze a little bit more perceived loudness out of this sample. All right, so when it comes to compression, probably the most common usage is going to be to try and tame the dynamic range of a specific element in your tracks. So for example, right here, I have this uh, this vocal stem, which I just received these stems from my engineer. This is one of the artists that, we're wor that I work with, uh, his newest song that we're working on right now. And I was in the session, so I know that he was running these vocals through a compressor when we recorded them. But as you can see, there are still some sort of spikes up here. And I think we could add another compressor on it to potentially try and level this level this vocal out. We want to try and get the vocal to sound at a more consistent level throughout. So compressors can be added onto individual instruments. They can be added onto a group of instruments. They can be added onto other buses like drum buses or individual drum samples. In my case, they could be added onto a vocal stem or vocal performance. We can also potentially add compression onto your mix bus or your master channel. Now this is getting a little bit more into mastering and I would actually recommend that you try to not do this, that you try to get a well-leveled and balanced mix without having to put compression on your master chain. That would be ideal. Also, if you're planning on sending your tracks off for mastering, the mastering engineer is most likely going to ask for there to be no sort of plugins or effects on your mix bus or master channel anyway. And while we're on the subject, just as a general rule, it's a good idea to not necessarily just go slapping compressors on everything without understanding what you're doing. And this kind of goes with really anything in production. It's a good idea to have sort of a, a plan of what you're trying to achieve before you just go doing a bunch of random stuff. Now, having said this, I mean, part of the fun of music production is experimenting and like, you know, just doing random stuff and having fun with it. And especially when you're a beginner, I think it's important to experiment with this stuff so that you can understand what it's actually doing. But there's sort of a fine line. And at some point, you're going to want to be a little bit more strategic with this type of stuff. All right. So I've got my fruity limiter here. And the reason I'm using a fruity limiter is because it has a really great visual representation of what's actually happening to various controls within our compressor. So the fruity limiter does have a compressor within it, we can access it by clicking this tab here. So now we're in our compressor. And the first two things that I want to just really focus on for right now is the threshold and the ratio. I think these are probably the two most important things to sort of understand when it comes to the compressor. And the reason why I say that is because these two things, if you don't know what they're doing, then it's very easy for you to not actually have your compressor doing anything at all. And that'll make sense in just a second. So let me explain the threshold first. So right now, if we hover over this, you'll notice that up here, we're at 0, 0.0 decibels. And basically what that means is that literally these peaks would have to go above zero decibels before the compressor would even kick in because they'd have to go above the threshold of the compressor before the compressor starts working. So I'm going to have to bring this down. You can see the blue line moving as I bring it down. Uh, I'm going to bring it down to like negative 16 decibels, uh, I guess negative 17 decibels. And well, I'm gonna go ahead and just play this audio real quick just so we can kind of get some visual feedback of what's going on on this compressor. So let's take a listen. I think I've had enough But I keep coming back I've got no nine to five Okay, so I think that's an okay place for us to be for the illustration 
purposes of this video, but you may or may not be able to tell that I'm actually not doing any sort of compression right now. And the reason for that is because I haven't set a ratio yet. Right now, for the ratio set at one to one, uh, we're basically just bypassing the ratio. There's no sort of actual compression going on. And I'm gonna do my best to explain the mathematics of the ratio. This is where things get kind of confusing in my opinion. But like I said, I'm gonna do my best to explain this. So hopefully you understand. Now I'm gonna set my ratio to three to one which is a pretty good place to be when it comes to vocals. It's a good kind of starting point. And we can mess with the threshold more and potentially move it up or down depending on kind of where we want it later. But in order to understand how the ratio works, essentially what it's saying is that for every three decibels that it goes above the threshold, you're getting only one decibel of playback. So for example, if this peak were to go six decibels above this threshold, then it would play two decibels above the threshold instead of the full six. So it's compressing that by, I guess, four decibels in that case. And so if we were to bring this ratio all the way up to 10 decibels, so now we have a ratio at 10 to one. So basically if this particular peak right here were to go a full 10 decibels above the threshold, it's only gonna play one decibel above the threshold. The higher the ratio, the closer we're getting to limiting. So pretty much we're approaching limiting territory and limiting is just basically a harder version of compression. All right, so let's do a little experiment and I'm gonna lower the threshold way down. I think I've had enough, but I keep coming back. All right, so I'd probably never go that low, but when we lose volume like that, we do have a gain knob right here. And essentially this is makeup gain. And so we can crank the gain up. This, this is basically adding gain after compression. So let's listen. I think I've had enough, but I keep coming back. And you can probably hear that that is pretty overly compressed. All right, so let's move on to another example to illustrate attack and release. So right now we have our attack time set to zero milliseconds, which is extremely fast. And generally anywhere in here is considered a fast attack all the way up to about 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds all the way up to about 100 milliseconds is considered to be a slow attack time. This particular compressor goes all the way up to 1000 milliseconds. So let's bring it back down. Right now I have my threshold set to 19 and my ratio set to five to one. So we're gonna be getting a good amount of compression going on here. And because my attack time is so fast, it's going to be essentially chopping off that transient right away. So I'll illustrate this by playing it. So you can see right here on the line how it kind of chops. Now if I bring the attack time to a slower rate, Basically what this is doing is it's taking longer for the compressor to kick in. So it's allowing that initial transient to, to come through the compressor more. And eventually we raise it to a point where it's basically not even doing any compression on this particular sample. So let's bring this back down. Now I wanna also illustrate the release. It's the same, same concept, except instead of triggering how fast the compressor kicks in, it triggers how fast or slow the compressor releases. So if I bring this release all the way over here, you can see that almost as soon as the transient hits, the compressor releases. So very quick release there. and we get all the way to the point where it's like this giant dip. So the compressor is very slowly releasing at that point. Okay, so the last thing that is pretty much universal to all compressors is the knee. And I just wanna briefly kind of explain what it does. Uh, so let's move the threshold up. So pretty much all compressors are going to, by default, have a hard knee. And what that means is that in order for the compressor to start working, these peaks, these transients are going to have to go above the threshold. Now, if we were to set a soft knee, what that means is that the compressor is actually going to start compressing some of these peaks even before they go above the threshold. Now, this can get kind of tricky because it does potentially mess with the attack and release, but it can be kind of a useful thing for vocals and guitars, various things like that. 
All right, guys, that's where I'm going to wrap up today's video. I really hope that you liked it. If you did, please go ahead, hit that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell notification. That's going to let you know every time I release videos in the future. Also, please let me know in the comments down below if you got something out of this video. And if you did, please share this with your producer friends. That's going to help them out. And it's also going to help me out continue to grow this channel. So I appreciate you for doing that. So compression is definitely a very important technique and process when it comes to music production especially for getting better mixes but it's only one technique and if you guys are still struggling to get better mixes check out the description of this video because i am giving away a free ebook that i put together a little while ago and basically within the ebook i try and kind of break down mixing into a, a sort of like simple five-step process that you guys can reference and make sure that you're following all the steps to get the best possible mix that you can so if you guys want to check that out go in the description you can enter your email address i'll send you the ebook you'll be on my email list i'll be sending you a bunch of other cool stuff and updates and like future youtube videos and that sort of thing so check that out and i will see you guys in the next video